My name is Ann Schaefer, and I am talking with Georgina Terry, who is the founder of the Wild Goose Chase, a women's only ride on the Eastern Shore that benefits the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. And I wanted to ask Georgina, who has, I don't know why you wouldn't know this, but if you know anything about women's biking, you would know that Georgina Terry founded a bike company and is still building bikes to this day. But I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give to young, well, not even young, women, second career like me, <laughs> women entrepreneurs? What's the secret sauce? Well, I think the secret sauce varies a little bit for everybody. But one thing I would say is I think people get too deep in the weeds thinking it out. You know, they go through these long self-examination routines and they look at the industry they're going to go into. My feeling has always been if there's something that you're so passionate about, you think you can make your own business run, then forget the naysayers. Don't drown in research. Just go out and start putting a stake in the ground and slowly but surely build it up. When I started my business, there were some people who said to me, oh, women will never go for bikes. And I'm like, you know what? I don't even want to talk to you. I don't care how smart you are, how successful you've been in business. I don't need any negative thoughts around me at this time. If you don't support me and think this is totally positive, don't even talk to me. And I think it's just, it's a single-mindedness. You know, you kind of just have to be driven. And you know what the goal is. And you know how you're going to feel when you get to that goal. So just... Go for things that make you feel very positive all the time. You want everyone on your side, everyone being a cheerleader for you. No naysayers. <laughs> That's good. I like it. It's amazing to me. I mean, I've only been riding really for, I don't know, 12 years or something. How since the early 80s when you started Terry, I feel like people are paying so much more attention to cycling now. The times have changed. Like, I don't know how or why, but it just seems so much more available, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I think it is more available. And I think a lot of that is because so many manufacturers are making bicycles of different styles and looking into different markets. And dealers themselves have become so much more sophisticated about things like fit and, and uh, customer service, that sort of thing. That all kind of adds up. And then when you think about what do people do with bicycles? Well, it used to be they just went out for the weekend and went for a ride. But now, certainly in a lot of areas, it's become a form of transportation. It's been a way to change people's lifestyles and change the, the whole lifestyle of the area in which you're living. I mean, every day you hear about how incredible Amsterdam is and why can't we be like Amsterdam? And really, why can't we be like Amsterdam now that we're talking about it? But people are thinking about that. But on the negative side, there, there seems to be so much more conflict between cars and bicyclists and rights to the road and rights to transportation and just, you know, general attitude on the part of a lot of motorists. It's my road, get off it, that kind of thing. Thank goodness for gravel biking and off-road riding because that's opened up things to people and stuff like the Katy Trail and the Gap, all of that. I mean, there's just tons and tons of stuff now that can appeal to cyclists. But I think we really still have to make inroads, establishing it as an urban means of getting around. And the people who ride bicycles aren't riding bicycles because they can't afford cars. They're riding bicycles because they care about the environment and their health and your environment and your health, not just theirs. You know, we're kind of short-sighted about that. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, Baltimore, <clears throat> excuse me, just this one street that kind of is a thoroughfare down into the Inner Harbor East neighborhood has been dug up for, I don't know, the last five years, it feels like. And I drove down wow. it the other night, and there's this, like, bike lane on both sides, and it's not a, you know, a little scooched over thing. It's wide. Yeah. I'm like, holy cow, go Baltimore. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, oh my God. But yeah, you know, you're right. And the other thing I think is that the sort of eco travel thing, the mm -hmm. women's touring thing, and also the existence of the wild goose chase as a place where you don't have to be riding next to these packs of guys who are trying to go 25 miles an hour the entire time. <laughs> you know, it's just like it's, I feel like the, the niche of, women of a certain age riding casually because they love being outside and with their friends like me and my friends here you know it's it's it feels like it's having its moment yeah for sure i think it definitely is without a doubt and you know what i think has helped with that and this is going to sound like well that doesn't make any sense at all is is swift the indoor cycling program have you ever used swift i have not 
it, it is absolutely amazing for people who live in colder climates, like Rochester, New York, in the winter, because it's incredibly social. I mean, those same people that you've been riding with during summer who don't want to go out in raunchy weather, you can now ride with in winter and still have conversations the same way you do on the bike and still not feel the wind in your face or your hair, but you feel those grades when the road goes up and you feel it ease up when the road goes down. It's really incredible. And it's uh, Stephanie and I have a lot of conversations about this, about why doesn't it attract more women? Uh, we have a great women's group who rides every Tuesday and Thursday, and we always try and attract more women into that group. It's really pretty cool. And the cool thing is, it doesn't detract you from riding outdoors. I mean, none of us who ride indoors would ever pass up on a nice day outdoors to ride on Swift. You know, we're like, gosh, it's going to be 60 tomorrow. Well, I won't see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> the two sort of playing together. They're not two separate worlds. And, and I think to some extent, if you get somebody interested in one side of it, you can get them interested in the other side of it and vice versa. I think you might be right. Yeah, I got a Peloton a few years ago, so I've kind of sucked a few of my crew into the Peloton world, which is yeah, which is nice because you can take the same class, but you can't really talk to each other during it unless you yeah. have your we're, phone. We're riding on roads. And the interesting thing about these roads is they are modeled after real places like Scotland and London and Paris, Fun. and areas of France. I mean, it's, wow. <laughs> it even rains. You never get wet, but your <laughs> avatar definitely gets wet. <laughs> I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, that also adds to the appeal of, of women and cycling, because it's just, there's so many different ways you can do it. And I I feel always feel like the through line is that you are able to have community doing it, and you can yeah. ride with your friends. That's huge. It is huge. And I mean, we, you know, we, we ride Tuesdays and Thursdays here in Baltimore. And afterwards, when we're done with our, you know, however long the ride is, it's like therapy session. You know? <laughs> like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Every Tuesday yeah. and every Thursday. I mean, not every week is somebody crying, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, I mean, we definitely have, have bonded in a way we never would have without cycling, I guess is how I should say yeah, that. Yeah, it's. You know, it's amazing how cycling does that. I find that when I'm out riding with friends, we have some of our best discussions on the bike than we ever do if we're just sitting around eating lunch somewhere. And all this stuff just kind of comes out. I don't know where it comes from, but, you know, we'll pick up on different topics. And and with complete strangers, even when you're meeting people for the first time, it's a great icebreaker. So you're like, oh, my God, what do we talk about? You always find something on a bike. <laughs> Yeah, I have a I have a podcast that deals with art and art history, and I was interviewing a wow. an art professor from Emporia, Kansas, not too long ago. Lovely guy, makes lovely work, and all of a sudden he says, you know, once a year I I have to make this little um, print. He's a printmaker, <clears throat> excuse me, and he makes this little print as an award to the first hundred people who make it through the it's a sun up to sun down two hundred miler oh. ride in Emporia, nice. Kansas. I forget what it's called. Ugh. Yeah, and I was like, wait a minute. Two, how can you do 200 miles while the sun is still up? Because I don't know, they do it, and it's on gravel. I'm like, gravel? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, there's some incredible rides on I gravel. Know. I'm like, oh, 200 miles on gravel? No, thank you. <laughs> I know. I've read some people's stories of doing that. on different. I mean, there are routes like that all over the United States now. And it's just like, why? I, mean, I guess I can understand why, but... Well, I don't know. I'd rather run. But to each his own, and they're on a bicycle, exactly. and that's it. <laughs> I'd just it. rather be on the Eastern Shore with you. <laughs> <laughs>